I'd now like to welcome Leanne Gunn from Northampton Stood Research, who's going to be presenting this session with her colleagues. Welcome, Leanne. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. It's lovely to know that so many of you are here. I know this has been a really popular session of, of today. Um, my name's Leanne Gunn and I work at Rothamsted Research, but I'm actually not one of our scientists. You're going to hear from two of our scientists in a little while. Um, my role at Rothamsted is actually um, in communications. So it's about attending events like this and talking a bit about Rothamsted and making sure that our scientists can come and be an inspiration to school students like yourselves. Um, before I launch into a little bit of a PowerPoint slide from my end, I just want to, to liven you all up a little bit and ask a couple of questions. And I think this will be a good chance to see if this chat function is working in the chat box. So Rothamsted research is all about agricultural science. So what I want to know from you is what words spring to mind when you hear agricultural science? So what sort of things come up? So if, here we go, we've got, we've got a mixture of, of Yes, nature, brilliant nature, that's good. So we definitely work a lot with nature, farming, perfect. Agriculture is really just a fancy way of saying farming. So a lot of our stuff's about farming. Yep, tractors, definitely got tractors, trees and farming. Chemical science, brilliant. Yes, we do, we do quite a lot of chemistry actually on site, even though maybe biology might be more of an obvious choice. Culture, yep, land and crops, perfect. We do quite a lot with wheat is one of our favorite crops. We work closely with wheat. Um, studying the science behind a farm, great, brilliant. Um, that's, that's lovely. So as I say, agriculture, farming, that's what our science is kind of all about. Um, if I just share my screen with you, there we go. You should be able to see this now. Um, oh, there we go. So Rothamsted Research, this is where we are um, based. So this is in Harpenden near, if any are from that kind of area. And this is our main site um, with all of our main buildings. And you can see we've got offices and labs and glass houses and controlled environments. So that's a place where we can grow plants and crops um, in, in a controlled way. So we know exactly what's going to affect those, those plants. Um, and then we've also got lots of fields, which is something that makes us stand out maybe from some other institutes, is that we can grow crops and run experiments out in nature in the fields and actually see what the elements do to the, those experiments, so test them in a real environment. Um, now we've actually got a really extensive history and I'm going to very briefly touch on this. So we've been going for over 175 years. Um, and it started with someone called Sir John Bennett Laws in 1834, who took over the Rothamsted estate and the manor. And he actually turned one of the bedrooms into a chemistry lab, although he wasn't actually a chemist. Um, he, my internet's deciding it's gonna be unstable, which is great. Um, yeah, he wasn't a chemist, but he wanted to look at the effect of fertilizers on um, wheat yield. So he started testing with animal bones and sulfuric acid um, and seeing what effect that had on the amount of wheat he could grow. And he eventually tied, teamed up with um, Henry Gilbert and they worked together to put some experiments in place with a little bit more science behind them and some mathematical theory and made them much more reliable experiments, a bit like you might do in school. And this big basket here of this field, um, this is an experiment that's still going today. So one of the great things we've got, and we've got experiments that have been running for hundreds of years. And that means that we've got a really good data set to look at how things change over time. But we're now a massive community of scientists and they all work together to answer a pretty big question really, which is how can we feed the world without harming the environment? Um, we know that population is growing across the world, so that's more people that we need to feed. So we need to think about how we can create enough food to feed this many people, but do it in a safe way. Someone said nature quite early on just now, so nature, how can we protect that environment and protect our planet? Um, and there's some pictures here of some things we do, but so maybe take three big examples. We might do some real cutting edge biology and look at genetic engineering and actually what can we do to the plants to maybe make them withstand things like climate change a bit better? 
or maybe we're looking at pests like the aphid up in that top corner and better ways of protecting our crops against um, pests and diseases. And we do also have a livestock farm down in Devon um, and that's where we have our cows and our sheep and we can look at what effect farming of livestock might have on the environment as well. And that's quite a topical point at the moment that I'm sure some of you know a bit more about. Um, now, our individual scientists probably don't feel like they are answering this massive question. That's a big thing for one person to ask. But as I say, there are a whole community working on it. But each one of our scientists have their own story that can lead into this um this this big answer and so i'm going to pass over now to a couple of our scientists so we've got tessa reed and chris stevens today who are both going to talk about about their journeys into science what they do at rothamsted um and tessa's going to be up first so i'll pass over to you now tessa yeah hi thanks leanne i'm just gonna share my screen okay so hi everyone my name's tessa and i'm going to talk to you today about the opportunities that a career in biology has given me and what it's like to be a PhD student at Rothamsted. Um, so who am I? Um, well, like I said, I'm a PhD student in plant science at Rothamsted Research. I study plant microbe interactions in wheat uh, in the hope that we can exploit the friendly bacteria in soil to improve soil health and reduce chemical inputs. Um, and just to clarify, a PhD is essentially a degree you do after your degree. Uh, the difference is that you get paid. Um, it's 15 grand a year, so it's not a lot, but uh, the hope is that once you graduate, you can then call yourself doctor and then this theoretically means you can move on to higher paid jobs. Um, I also have a life outside my PhD, or I at least try to, because I fully believe in work-life balance. So I'm massively into yoga and Netflix, and I own two cats and just recently a new puppy. Um, so I took a pretty generic path into a PhD. Um, in that I went from school to university to a PhD. Uh, the thing I want to point out most here is the variety of placements I got to do um, um, and experience on my career path. So GSK offer a work experience week for students in lower sixth, which I can highly recommend if you're interested in doing any science. It's a really valuable experience of life in a STEM industry. Um, and then through reaching out to various people by email, I got to do a month's work experience in plant conservation in South Africa. Um, and that's another thing, if you were interested in some work experience, it really is worth just looking up places you're interested in and sending them an email. Uh, the worst that can happen is they respond saying no or don't respond at all, but um, you'll find that a lot of people are really willing to help uh, younger students. Uh, then lastly, straight after my undergraduate degree, I got to work with Shell in Houston, Texas on sustainable biofuels from plant matter. Um, so truly with a career in biology, it gives you the opportunity to explore a lot of new and really cool places. Um, it could be from nature reserves to uh, the ocean, it could be Antarctica. I've got a colleague that spent a few months in Antarctica on a research placement um, or from the middle of nowhere in South Texas. Um, so moving on to what I do day to day um, at Rothamsted as a researcher, uh, my days can be quite varied. So when I'm in the laboratory, which I'd say would be about 60% of my time, this would be spent actually setting up and performing experiments. Um, a lot of my work involves soil bacteria. So I'll grow wheat in pots in greenhouses and then sample soil from the roots. I'll then dilute this soil in water and plate it on agar 
which produces bacteria like in the bottom middle picture. Um, so soil is very much full of life and contains millions and millions of bacteria which actually contribute to soil health, uh, similar to the healthy bacteria that are in your gut. Uh, and then I'll use assays like the blue plates in the corner to identify the beneficial bacteria, which in this case, the um, bacteria that glow orange are ones that can solubilize iron, which is a key uh, nutrient for plants. Um, and then I'd say about 10% of my time is spent field sampling and I really enjoy these days. They're spent entirely outside, whatever the weather, and you'll sample with your team. And it's usually spent doing pretty simple tasks like digging up wheat and keeping the roots for analysis or taking soil cores. Um, we also have a machine called a Picaro, which measures gas outputs from plants and from soil. Um, Rothamsted have a lot of large field experiments, which are really valuable for agricultural science because it allows us to take our small scale laboratory experiments um, and test them at a larger scale to potentially uh, actually use commercially at farms. Um, and then finally, I'd say the remaining 30% of my time is spent on analysis and paper writing. Uh, one thing I especially want to point out here is that my work actually involves a lot of computer skills such as coding and programming using Linux based systems. Um, and this is something I didn't really think I would learn to do in a biology career, but, but we actually use it a lot. And I enjoy that part of my work so much and love that I get to learn those skills. Um, so I don't think that biology means just lab work. There's actually a lot more skills involved. Um, such as coding skills that you will need to learn for bioinformatics analysis. Um, and this, these pictures is just my post COVID working from home office, which there's not always that much space. Um, so yeah, managing a research project. This is really what encompasses a PhD. Um, <laughs> And it's basically all about time management. You basically have three years to um, perform experiments and write them up. I'd like say probably about 100,000 words um, by the end of three years. Um, so this involves a lot of planning of what you're gonna do on a day-to-day -day basis, but then also what you're gonna do sort of for the rest of the year, for next year, for, for your final year. Um, uh, yeah, then just quickly, um, a large part of our work involves communicating our research to other scientists, but also really importantly, the public. Um, and there's actually a debate going on in science about um, like, is it a researcher's right and purpose to um, communicate their science to the wider world? Because if you can't communicate what you're doing to wider society, then what's the point of doing it? It's like if David Attenborough did all his research and then never produced any programs, how would we all know those fascinating facts about nature and our planet? Um, so that's just a whole other area of a career in science. You actually have to have really good communication skills. Um, and then additionally, there are a lot of outreach opportunities similar to the one I'm doing today, but also um, so Rotham said we're involved in Brighton Pride last year um, as part of AgRespect, which is all about LGBT representation in agriculture. And we got to be part of the parade next to the fabulous multicolored tractor, uh, tractor called uh, Sassy Ferguson. Um, but yeah, the challenges. Um, so some days can feel like this. Um, when it comes to managing your own research project, there is a lot to think about. Um, so like at the moment, I'm kind of working on three big uh, experiments. I'm currently like writing up an experiment for a paper. I'm doing the analysis for a second experiment and I'm just about to start um, a final 
sort of big pot experiment in the greenhouse. So some days I do feel a bit like, like this, like I just want to put my head on the desk, but that's not every day. And um, the challenges you kind of encompass in a PhD is all quite sort of challenges that you can solve yourself, um, which I, I really like. Um, so what you need is literally, it's just enthusiasm, resilience, independence, and communication. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of you already have these skills. Um, the, the other skills you learn on the PhD, but when you start out, it's really just about having these kind of four key skills, enthusiasm mostly. Uh, so just to sum up, um, anyone can do a PhD. Uh, motivation and patience are far more important than intelligence and knowledge. Um, a career in biology can give you a diverse range of opportunities and experiences. Uh, agricultural science will always be an important industry to work in. Um, it's all about feeding the world, etc. Um, and whichever path you choose, try to keep a strong support network of family and friends behind you and definitely have hobbies outside of work because there's more to life than work. Um, so I'm just gonna pass over to my colleague, Chris, and thanks for listening. Ah, thanks so much, Tessa, that was, uh, that was great. Um, okay, hopefully I can also share my, my slides. Um, yeah, well, Tess has really um, brilliantly kind of summed up the, the life of the, the PhD student, and I think I share a lot of um, kind of parallels with her of how she got into uh, into the uh, to be a PhD student and and uh, why she she enjoys it. I'm going to share a little bit about yeah why why I really enjoy doing biology, why I think it's really important, and some of the really cool stuff that you can do as part of a PhD course, and also with the skill set that you gain as um, as part of, of studying. Biology. Um, let's see if I can. Okay. okay, so um, so why why study biology? So I think I could boil it down personally to um, uh, basically curiosity about the world. So like all organisms, so uh, plants, animals, and fungi are, are made up of of uh, cells, as you as you may know, and those cells are essentially like tiny little machines that are carrying out functions in order for the organism to basically survive and, um, and to, keep, uh, yeah, to keep living. And what I study is uh, molecular biology, um, which is basically the study of DNA and proteins, which allow those cells to carry out their functions. Um, and uh, it's a really cool area of science because as well as being able to understand these, these mechanisms and, and like all science, often you find when you're doing research, you, you will discover things that literally no one else, no one else on earth um, knows at that time, which is just a really brilliant feeling. Um, the other thing that is great about science is we get to use some really cool kit. So uh, here we have uh, Kirsty, who helps run the bioimaging lab here at Rothamsted, and um, some of the really cool uh, kind of equipment that we've got here. So uh, microscopes, and then at the bottom we've got some some of the amazing images that uh, the bioimaging team can take uh, using this equipment. Um, okay, so what, what do I study in particular? So I'm what's known as a plant pathologist, which is basically a fancy way of saying that I look at diseases of plants. Um, so what I study in particular is this fungus that attacks wheat. Uh, so here you have a, a field of wheat on the left and the, the browning leaves are infected with this disease. And in the middle, um, you can see a, an infected leaf. Um, and then on the right is a like microscopic image of the, the strands of the fungus, known as hyphae, basically on the leaf surface and surrounding um, the, the leaf stomata, which is just a hole that the leaf essentially uses to breathe through. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, this, I know this sounds like a quite a niche area of, of research and doesn't have many um, applications for, uh, for, for real life, but if this pathogen and other pathogens like it are allowed to spread unchecked, then that can have real, really serious consequences as um, it can wipe out entire uh, wheat crops across countries or even entire regions. And that can lead to um, yeah, serious consequences involving a, a lack of um, wheat for bread and then a, uh, a steep rise in the cost of bread. 
So um, as an example, you may be aware of the, um, the civil war in Syria, uh, the rise of ISIS and the Mediterranean uh, migrant crisis. Well, all of those issues stem from the 2011 Arab Spring revolt. And that in part was caused by a steep rise in bread prices in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, so I know that these images might seem slightly preposterous and like, especially to us in a Western country, the idea of a food shortage seems a world away, but it's important to remember, especially uh, with the events of this year, that we are not immune from our environments. And this is why uh, this kind of research and being able to um, uh, prevent this kind of thing from happening by, by researching how to fight these diseases, these pathogens is so important. Um, okay, so how exactly do we uh, investigate these, these wheat diseases and what do I do on a day-to-day -day, uh, level? Now, sadly, I haven't got the, uh, the same brilliant images that Tessa has got of her, uh, her working in the lab, but uh, just to show you um, kind of this, some of the stuff that I get up to, uh, one of the things we can do is look at how the fungus infects the wheat on a microscopic level. And as we've seen this image here of the fungi on top of the, uh, the leaf surface, and then the second image on the right is the fungi actually within the, uh, the leaf itself, so colonizing inside the leaf. And you can see at the bottom of the right image the, the level of magnification that you have in these images. And they're because it's because they're taken with this amazing piece of uh, equipment called a scanning electron microscope, which instead of using light, is basically firing electrons at a super cooled piece of material. So this leaf material is super cooled using liquid nitrogen. Um, and then it uses the electrons to create a computer generated image. Um, and this is really, really useful because basically learning how the fungi is infecting the wheat can help us um, formulate ways of protecting the wheat from the, uh, the fungi. Uh, okay, so what else uh, can we do? We can also use what is known as a uh, molecular toolkit um, to study the proteins that the fungus uses to, uh, to attack the wheat and also the proteins the wheat uses to defend itself against the fungus. So one of the really cool things we can do is we can use um, a, the special bacterium known as agrobacterium, which you can see in the bottom center, and you can literally just squeeze them into the leaf of a plant using this um, blunt tipped syringe. So that's a solution filled with these bacteria and you literally just squeeze it into the uh, leaves. It's known as infiltration. And then on the right, we have some leaves that, uh, that I created a few days after that infiltration. So the bacteria, uh, the reason they're special is they can transfer DNA into the plant cells and then those plant cells will produce a protein. Um, so the top left uh, spots on this leaf that's under UV light, as you can see, it's growing green, green and that's because it's creating what's known as a green fluorescent protein. Now, these proteins are really useful to us for studying, um, studying biology and they were first identified in, um, in jellyfish back in the 1980s. So I'm sure you've seen uh, David, and David Attenborough documentaries that uh, Tess was talking about previously and the, um, the bioluminescence of um, of organisms, of fish and, and jellyfish in the ocean. Well, that's where this protein was first isolated from. And it's really, really useful. And the bottom left spot is a fungus, sorry, is a, a protein that the fungus that I study produces, um, which actually kills the plant cells, which you can see the discoloration there. And again, that's really, it, this kind of technology is really useful for us to know what these, these proteins are doing. Um, so what's more, we can also use uh, what's known as a confocal microscope um, to look at exactly where these fluorescent proteins are located in cells. So these are the same uh, leaves, but um, basically uh, magnified to, to microscopic levels uh, to look at the cells within those leaves. Um, and on the left, you have um, a leaf that is a leaf cell that is expressing what's known as red fluorescent protein. So just like the green fluorescent protein, but it, um, it takes in the, the UV light, or in this case, for the confocal microscope, the, the lasers that uh, the confocal microscope shoots at the, uh, the leaf um, and then emits red light. And then this red fluorescent protein is attached to a, um, a membrane protein. And that's why you can see the red is um, located around the edge of the cell. And on the right, you have the same red fluorescent protein, but with a green fluorescent protein in the center and in the nucleus. And as you can see, it creates these really amazing um, 
pretty images. And it's also really useful for us because when you're studying proteins in, in plants or fungi or whatever, one of the first things you want to know about how they work is where, they, where they're located in cells. And so this is a really useful tool for us. Um, so finally, and I'm very aware that I'm sure you're tired of hearing about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, but I think this illustrates a really um, a good example of the, the kind of uh, the transferable skill set that you get as part of doing a biology or a molecular biology degree in my case. And so despite the fact that I work primarily on plants and fungi, um, when the lockdown happened back in March and April, I ended up working in the COVID-19 testing center at Milton Keynes, the Lighthouse Lab, which you may have seen Boris Johnson and Matt Hancock visiting periodically. Um, and what this lab is doing is it was detecting the RNA of the COVID-19 um, virus. So on the bottom right, that's the, the kind of the genome of the virus. So all the RNA that the virus has, and we were using uh, what's known as a qPCR test to basically try to detect, detect that RNA in the swab samples that patients were sending us from around the country. Um, and these are some pictures of me with the teams that I was working with. And please don't pass judgment. This is before face masks um, were mandatory. And also it was a very small lab with lots of people. So social distancing was sadly not, uh, not possible, but uh, things, things have improved um, a lot since, uh, since then. But um, one of the things I wanted to emphasize about how cool working in this lab was, was that we got to work with, uh, with robots. So the top images, you can see the, the, the left one, um, that robot has a mechanical arm, which is basically transferring um, liquid from one plate into another at an incredibly high throughput rate. Um, and then the image on the right is a, a robot that basically carries out RNA extractions at a really um, high rate. And these robots were like really amazing to work with and really, really cool tech. Um, and as you can see from the picture on the bottom, we had absolutely loads of them. So using all of these uh, robots, this lab is able to carry out more than 40,000 tests every, every single day, which is just an amazing, like phenomenal achievement. And they're working night and day on this. So as an illustration, the shift that is working right this moment started at eight o'clock this morning and will still be there at 8 p.m. tonight, um, all to just get on top of this, uh, this disease and try to, try to contain it. Um, so yeah, thank you so much um, for listening. I really hope it's been kind of interesting and enlightening as to the kind of stuff that, that we get up to here. Um, and yeah, please ask away if you have any questions. And I think I'm gonna pass back to uh, Leanne. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, I'm actually gonna pass over to, not Nessa, is it? No. Hi Leanne, yeah, hi. I have been keeping an eye on the chat. I mean, that was just wonderful um, to hear about, you know, the, the work that you do and the impact it has across the world. And Chris and Tessa, thank you. I, I learned so much this morning and I'm sure the, the young people on the call um, did as well. There are just a couple of questions. I mean, one I wanted to pick up was, um, someone's asked, what's RNA? Are you able to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's really, it's, it's very, very interesting. It's, it kind of stems to the, what's known as the central dogma of uh, molecular biology. And RNA essentially is like, um, it plays a number of different roles, but in, in humans, um, it is essentially the messenger between the DNA, which is basically the, the manual that contains all the information about how a cell is supposed to work in a human cell. And the RNA is basically transferring those messages out into the cell in order for proteins to be created. Now in viruses, it's slightly different because um, the COVID-19 virus, for example, uh, all the information is held only on RNA because these are incredibly primitive organisms. I mean, some people wouldn't even describe them as, as organisms because mm -hmm. they are so primitive. But, um, but yeah, the, you can say that they have different uh, roles in different, um, in different organisms. But RNA is essentially very similar to DNA, but it, it has a, a single strand. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the, um, the double helix, the kind of the twisty ladder of the, the DNA. Well, in RNA, there is only a single strand. So you can imagine a single, um, uh, a single arm of the ladder and the, the kind of rungs sticking out um, rather than being connected to the other. 
the other arm. So I hope that's uh, kind of illustrated. <laughs> what, no, what thank I'm... you, Chris. That's actually really clear to see. So what you're saying effectively is small but important. Um, not not DNA, but you know, similar. Um, you know, very crude for for us non scientists, I guess, to see. Um, there are lots of questions coming through, so I'm just going to pick some of those out for you. Um, they some of the students are asking, you know, have you had any other sort of jobs, and what inspired you really get into this aspect of of, of science, really in STEM? Um, I I can answer the. Um, I'd say like you probably know more what previous jobs I've had, but what inspired me to get into science was um, I really did just love plants from a young age. I was a massive weirdo, um, but I genuinely just really thought plants were amazing. Um, the fact that they could like live and grow uh, simply from like taking food from the air. Um, I just thought they were like so fascinating. And um, then I really enjoyed biology A-level um, and that's what made me do a degree uh, in biology at university and then the other kind of things just like fell into place um, on, on like as, as you go. Um, but sort of from school I, I kind of always wanted to study plants um, and this was reinforced by really enjoying biology a level um and like chris explained it really well the kind of cells are like the you know building blocks of life and it was i just thought that was amazing and that's like what i wanted to study um and rothamsted um is quite near to where i live so um i'd kind of always known about it um and did a 10-week placement there one summer and realized it was a really cool place to work, which is why I decided to do uh, a PhD there. Thank you, Tessa. That actually answers one of the other questions. I'll come back to you in just a moment, Chris, about maybe the, the path that you've taken. So it sounds like doing it, doing an A-level that you're really passionate about that's gonna help you um, and having the opportunities nearby, maybe doing some of that work experience for a couple of weeks and you know, getting, getting to grips with what it might be like to work somewhere like you know, Rothamsted has actually really spurred you along, hasn't it? So that's really great to hear and really great for the young people to see that the, taking up those opportunities for work experience is really, is really important as well. Chris, anything that you can add to that about the career path and what inspired you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I have to admit that I think my um, education career path is quite similar to, to Tessa's, just having an interest in biology from, from a relatively young age, but uh, to be to be fair, I did end up doing biochemistry uh, for my undergrad, and that was actually at the University of East Anglia in, in Norwich, uh, which hopefully some of our, our listeners uh, um, are locals of. And I ended up working as a technician after that undergrad um, at a um, at a, a company that does uh, seed treatments uh, in agriculture, which is how I got into, uh, uh, into the idea of, of studying agriculture. And I, I thought it was really um, it was really cool because um, working and living in Norwich, uh, you have so much agriculture all around you. And when you're driving around, you, know, you can see the fields and you can see the impact that your, your work can have um, on you know, people's livelihoods and people's you know, ability to, to get food and things. I, I think it's really, it's really brilliant to see that connection between what you're researching and how it um, plays out in the, in the real world. And I think that's what really inspired me to go on then and do, um, do a PhD here at Rothamsted. Thank you, Chris. That's really great to hear the inspirations that you've had throughout, actually, from school, you know, going to university and, and, and after. They really do have a lasting impact. So uh, hopefully the young people on, on the call um, will bear that in mind, certainly as, as, as they grow as well. Leanne, I think a couple for you here. Um, we've got somebody asking how many people work at your research centre? Yeah, we've got, I think it's around 400 members of staff, of which are just under 300 are scientists. And we obviously have a lot of other staff as well, sort of the kind of support staff and the business side of it, just keeping everything ticking over and running. But yeah, we're at like around 300 scientists and um, we're spread across multiple sites as well. So our main site's in Harpenden, which is where both Chris and Tessa are based. Um, but we yeah. do have our other smaller site down in, in Devon, which is where our livestock farm is. And we've also got a couple of others, one over in Suffolk um, and one up near 
Milton Keynes in Woburn and they're more just sort of little farms but we do a lot of work on those right. places as well yeah. so we're spread about and that somebody else is asking actually about the multiple centres around the world do you have any or is it all based in the UK we are all based in the UK but there are obviously agricultural research centres all over the world and there's a few others in the UK as well so that it's going on all over the place but Rotham said a, a UK base mm. okay and there's a few sort of sorry Tessa uh, we do have a lot of like collaborations um, with research research institutes uh, around the world. So okay, yeah. and that's great, isn't it? Although you're based here, actually, it yeah. is quite multinational as well. And you talked earlier about the impact that your work has on um, so many different things. And that, Chris, this might be one for you. But um, we've got a question around how do you manage to stop the wheat from the potential damage from pathogens? Are you able to answer that one? Yeah. So so historically, um, a lot of it. And kind of interesting that somebody uh, said uh, kind of chemical science when Leanne asked about what they thought of, of agriculture, because historically a lot of the, the ways in which these, uh, these fungi have been contained is through pesticides. Now, unfortunately, because of the pressures of evolution, these fungi have, a lot of them have developed resistance to those fungicides. So actually using um, these kind of genetic tools to prevent the, uh, the spread of these diseases is now incre increasingly important. And so we're looking now at uh, what's known as res resistance genes, which are genes within the wheat DNA that code for that provide resistance against these fungi. And because some wheat varieties have them and others don't, we want to find out what, what exactly those, those genes are doing in order to then breed them into other wheat varieties so that all wheat can be protected in the same way, essentially. Thank you, Chris. And um, to what extent has COVID interrupted your research? Actually, I don't know if all of you want to sort of jump in and answer that one. Um, of course, we you know we have to talk about COVID at some point, but um, I wonder if it has limited what you can do and the kind of collaborations as well. Um, and alongside that, there's a really interesting question about the robotic pieces of kit in your lab. Um, what were they used for before COVID testing? Shall, shall I talk about the the robots first, and then we can we can move on to the the disruption. Um, so we, I think we possibly might have a new, a new robot in, in the lab, but we don't actually work with robots primarily because they are, they tend to be uh, used for um, kind of uh, high throughput um, work and also are incredibly expensive. So not, not many labs can necessarily afford them, but obviously because of the importance of the COVID-19 testing, uh, there's been a lot of money put into that COVID-19 testing lab in Norton Keynes. Um, and it just goes to show just how much, you know, the amount of resources that the government's putting in because the, the, the robots with the robotic arm that I was showing, I think they're somewhere in the region of £250,000 a piece. And there are at least 10 in the lab that I, I was in. Um, and that is just one robot for doing one specific thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we, we don't necessarily have that much experience of using them in our our day-to-day -day work in the in the PhDs, um, but so it was it was really cool for me to be able to to get some experience of working with them. Um, and then uh, yeah, Tessa, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about the kind of disruption for our PhDs. Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, I'd say it is very much a case by case basis um, on your PhD. Like different students have had different experience experiences. I was was lucky with that when the work from home um, started, that's when I had already planned to write up a paper. So I didn't have any experiments ongoing. Um, and then I think we spent about 10 weeks working from home and Rotham said we're really, really good at sort of getting the people who needed to be back in the lab like the PhD students because we worked towards a deadline. Um, I think we spent 10 weeks working from home and then uh, we could start going back into the lab but just by a rotor basis um, you know um, I mean as scientists we wear PP anyway like lab coats, gloves, uh, like now masks um, so we were able to like go back and work in the lab Safe, safely and socially distanced. Um, so for me, it, it hasn't really disrupted my research. It just means that the analysis and paper writing part I'll do from home. Um, but I do know that 
saw some of my colleagues, they might have set up a big plant experiment that they needed to sample when lockdown was happening uh, and they couldn't sample it and sort of lost that experiment, which um, in terms of their PhD, like it's fine, you know, you just, they'll just need to do the experiment again, but it's just, it, it's a pain when you've spent a lot of time setting up an experiment, but um, genuinely it hasn't really affected our industry too much um, because I mean, we can still do a lot of our work just on Zoom. Um, I'd say the biggest thing would be the, the conferences have had to be postponed and conferences are a really big part of um, of research and um, I just they're just not the same on on zoom as they are in person you don't really have that um, kind of networking that you get at a face-to-face -face conference but I mean hopefully they'll soon be able to operate again yeah, no, thank you, Tessa. So it sounds like lots of disruption. I'm sure schools um, who are on the call are very aware of that. And uh, I guess resilience, isn't it? That's what's coming through from what you're all saying, that um, things can go wrong and you set up these wonderful things and, um, you know, they don't always work out because of things outside your control. So lots of skills that, uh, that obviously you're, you're relearning and, and learning and putting to use as well. Um, I am really conscious of the time because I know some schools do need to get away. Um, there are lots of questions. Um, just one really about important discoveries. Have you made any important discoveries, perhaps yourselves or within your team or within the actual sort of, um, you know, within what the time maybe is not now, but in, in the past, or are you hoping to make any um, fantastic discoveries that you are, you're allowed to tell us about? I mean, I think, Chris, you just recently published a paper, didn't you? Uh, I've, I've submitted submitted a paper, um, but I think the one of the, the more interesting uh, discoveries that was made in our lab was actually just before I started and I'm, I'm kind of working on a, my project is, is looking at, at this thing, which is a, a new uh, resistance gene um, in, in wheat that was uh, identified. And it's actually the first resistance gene that has been identified for the fungus that I study. And it's a really, um, it was a really good paper. It's a, it ended up in, in Nature, which is quite a prestigious journal. Um, and again, as Tessa kind of alluded to, uh, that was actually a really big co collaboration with people in, in Norwich and also people in, in France and elsewhere, kind of scientists coming from, you know, internationally to work on this, um, on this paper. And it's a really, it's a really cool advancement because it's the first time that one of these resistance genes has been, has been cloned. Um, and so my project is basically to try and work out a little bit more about what exactly its function is. Um, so, so yeah, so we've, we yeah we get to get to be involved in some really cool discoveries and yeah kind of be right at the cutting edge um, of of new new discoveries. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I you know it's, it's what you said, isn't it, earlier that actually um, it's something that um, the the kind of research you're doing is is needed in the in the world. Um, it, you know, food's not going to go out of fashion, um, so it, it's very important. How about you, Tessa? Before we finish. Um, yeah, I'd say um, the team I work in, um, we're kind of more about um, it sort of more like less kind of cutting edge discoveries, but more kind of um, utilizing the kind of natural soil bacteria that's um, present in soil and actually using that as a way to maybe reduce chemical inputs from soil so I mean um Chris works on like um reducing uh pathogen attack by kind of looking at the genes and resistance resistance genes but also um kind of beneficial soil bacteria can play a large role in reducing um like wheat disease and plant disease in general um and so for example like chemical kind of pesticide input can actually get rid of these beneficial bacteria um, and we're kind of looking at ways to reintroduce them back in this, into the soil to reduce chemical inputs to kind of improve sort of general like um, soil and environment, environmental health. Mm, thank you. So it, so it sounds like di very different, but actually um, very valuable, isn't it, in terms of what you're doing and actually advancing 
cultural science. So thank you so much. I learned so much this morning. Um, I know we haven't answered every single one of your questions um, to the schools, but um, I am conscious of the time. Well, thank you so much, Tessa and Chris. I wish you all the very best with all your research and uh, um, look forward to hearing about more discoveries, uh, important discoveries that you make. And Leanne as well, thank you very much for organising and, and being on the call as well. We will be sending an evaluation out. I know Vanessa's put it on the chat twice for you. So teachers, if you could fill those in for us, um, and I believe you'll get them by email as well, would really appreciate um, your feedback back thank you for a wonderful presentation and schools thank you um and goodbye thank you thank you yeah.